governs, and she never governs wisely. The colonies are not to be emancipated. All men are created equal. Victory or death. Control of the seas had given the British a tremendous advantage in the early years of the war. If a British army on the coast were in trouble, the British Navy could sail in and whisk that army away. But with France as America's ally, Washington could now contemplate what control of the seas might mean for the American cause. And at Yorktown, he and his French partners would exploit French sea power with tremendous success. With the entire South poised to fall to the British, Congress asked Washington to appoint a commander for the Southern Army. Washington turned for help to the man who had been the most reliable and important officer in all his campaigns. That was Rhode Island General Nathaniel Greene, a former Quaker. He was an unusual general. He had a bum leg, walked with a limp. But what a bright guy he was. He, and he had really completely absorbed Washington's strategy of an army to look the enemy in the face. And none in Greene's Southern Army could look the enemy in the face with more courage than the Virginia frontiersman known as the Old Wagoner, newly appointed Brigadier General Daniel Morgan. The people described him as very muscular. Uh, they described him as a giant of a man, very physical. In his youth, Morgan had survived 500 lashes from the British during the French and Indian War in 1755. He and his Virginia riflemen had been with Benedict Arnold on the epic march to Quebec in 1775. He had been among the last to surrender when the Americans tried to take that walled city. And he and his riflemen had been decisively effective against Burgoyne at the battles known as Saratoga in 1777. Now, suffering from a bad back and arthritis, he was ready for the battle of his life. It's only a little battle in many ways. Uh, there was no, really no more than about 3,000 men total, you know, on both sides. But what an impact this had on the war. In early January of 1781, Morgan received a message in the field from Nathaniel Green. Colonel Tarleton is said to be on his way to pay you a visit. I doubt not, but he will have a decent reception and a proper dismission. General Nathaniel Green. This is the spot where Morgan decided to fight. An open area known as the cow pens, because cows had been corralled here before driving them to market. With the broad river to Morgan's back, Tarleton had but one avenue of attack and the old wagoner had no chance of retreat. Morgan, in a number of conversations and letters to friends, had expressed a desire to have a crack at Tarleton, to get at Tarleton. He saw Tarleton as his counterpart in the British Southern Army and recognized the value of trying to destroy the Tory Legion. 
The butcher Tarleton was pleased when he learned of his enemy's position. It is certainly as good a place for action as Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton could desire. America does not produce any more suitable to the nature of the troops under his command. Bannister Tarleton. The night before the battle, Morgan used his canny frontiersman's understanding of psychology to prepare his troops. He went among the volunteers, helped them fix their swords, joked with them about their sweethearts, told them to be in good spirits and the day would be ours. And long after I laid down, he was going among the soldiers, encouraging them and telling them that the old wagoner would crack his whip over Ban in the morning, as sure as they lived. Just hold your heads, boys, three fires, he would say, and you are free. And then when you return to your homes, how the old folks will bless you and the girls kiss you for your gallant conduct. I don't believe he slept a wink that night. Thomas Young, a volunteer at Calpins. An hour before daybreak, Morgan's pickets brought word that Tarleton's Legion and other crack British troops were less than five miles away and marching fast down this road. Boys, get up. Banny is coming. Daniel Morgan. Morgan put his green militiamen in front. They fired, then, according to a prearranged plan, they dropped back. Tarleton viewed the action as a retreat. Tarleton's men surged forward. They broke ranks in their enthusiasm and their uh, anticipation. And at that point, then, Morgan's main line loosed a really lethal blast that just staggered, decimated many of the forward units. When the regulars fired, it seemed like one sheet of flame from right to left. Oh, it was beautiful. Thomas Young. Sweeping in from the right was George Washington's cousin, William Washington and his cavalry. This man deserves to be remembered. He, he, he too was a bull, oh, even more than Morgan. He had a neck like a pro football player, and he was a great cavalryman. In a few moments, Colonel Washington's cavalry was among them like a whirlwind, and the poor fellows began to keel from their horses without being able to remount. The shock was so sudden and violent, they could not stand it, and immediately betook themselves to flight. James Collins, militiaman. Morgan's militia and Continental regulars had been attacked and now began to regroup the old wagoner rallied them. Militiaman James Collins remembered it this way. Morgan rode up in front and waving his sword cried out, Form, form, my brave fellas. Give them one more fire and the day is ours. Old Morgan was never beaten. And Morgan said, Charge! And they lowered their bayonets and they charged from that side and William Washington and his 120 cavalrymen hit the British from the other side, and the whole British army evaporated. Uh, half of them threw down their guns and begged for mercy. The other half just started legging it down the road. And this battle turned the whole revolution around in the state of, of South Carolina, and it destroyed the cream of Tarleton's legion, which meant that, that the British army no longer could make these lightning strikes. In less than an hour of fighting, 110 of Tarleton's legion and supporting British forces were killed. 200 were wounded, and 500 became prisoners. Morgan lost only 12 men. Cornwallis lost what he called the eyes and ears of his army, Tarleton's legion. He then surged forward in a vain effort to destroy Morgan's unit that was obviously much smaller than his main army. But Morgan and his men, now joined by Commanding General Green, had disappeared into the North Carolina countryside. Cornwallis was um, one of the ablest 
of the British commanders. He was a vigorous, aggressive, sanguine, but ultimately, I'm afraid, there was a, a, a misjudgment. He was lured into pursuing Green across North Carolina, back from, from river to river, and of course losing, losing men uh, on the way. Morgan claimed back problems and malarial fevers and chose to return to his home in Virginia. Green's task was now to win back the South while keeping his weakened and vulnerable army intact. His basic strategy was not to win battles, it was not to lose them. We fight, get beat, rise, and fight again. General Nathaniel Green. Although Morgan had quit the theater of battle, he left Green chillingly efficient advice. You have a great number of militia. If they fight, you beat Cornwallis. If not, he will beat you and perhaps cut your regulars to pieces. Put the militia in the center with some picked troops in their rear to shoot down the first man that runs. Daniel Morgan. When Green's army met Cornwallis at this site at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, his line of militia did flee. But his regulars held, and soon Cornwallis had to turn to a brutally cold logic of his own to save his army. He gave the order to fire upon friend and foe alike with cannon. This is an 18th century grape shot, which would have been discharged from a cannon you discharged a barrel full of those at, at the enemy, rather like an enormous blunderbuss. At the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, an attack mingled British and American troops. Uh, the, the, the moment was extremely critical, and Cornwallis's solution to it was to order his artillery to open on the whole mass with, with grape shot. It flew in among them, killing and wounding both sides, but breaking up the attack and um, giving the British time to recover. A ruthless way of treating the situation, but one that worked. At the end of the battle, Cornwallis had possession of the field, but a quarter of his men were killed, wounded, or missing. Green had accomplished his goal. His army had survived. Lord Cornwallis has conquered his troops out of shoes and provisions, and himself out of troops. Horace Walpole. Cornwallis now virtually abandoned the Carolinas to Green, who set upon a systematic strategy of winning those states back from the British. The English commander marched towards his supply base in Wilmington, North Carolina. That march would continue to Virginia, eventually taking him to a camp on the Yorktown Peninsula and a siege that would change the course of history. French General Comte de Rochambeau was not impressed with his allies when he sailed into Newport, Rhode Island with over 5,000 French troops in July of 1780. After just five days in America, he wrote, Send us troops, ships, and money, but do not count on these people nor on their resources. They have neither money nor credit. Their forces only exist momentarily. Comte de Rochambeau. In spite of heroic efforts by financier Robert Morris, the American cause was on the verge of economic collapse. In a country that would not have its first bank until 1781, the citizens put little faith in continental dollars backed by the promises of Congress. In the spring of 1781, Washington knew how desperate his situation was. If France delays timely aid now, it will avail us nothing if she attempts it hereafter. We are at the end of our tether. And now or never, our deliverance must come. George Washington, late spring, 1781. Times were desperate for France, too. She had been financing her own participation in the war and also providing the Americans with huge sums of money. 
They couldn't pay the debts stemming from their participation in the American Revolution, which cost over a billion French pounds and the equivalent of several years worth of total income of the French monarchy. In fact, the French government was approaching bankruptcy and 1781 was the last roll of the dice. After his disastrous battles against Morgan and Green in the Carolinas, Cornwallis found new opportunities in Virginia. Virginia was practically defenseless. Uh, they, they had lost their enthusiasm for the war in many respects. This was a huge state, 700,000 people in Virginia. And this little British army was just marching up and down the state at will. Cornwallis received support in Virginia from the newest British general, Benedict Arnold. Arnold, for some time, led forces in the Virginia area. He would uh, go into an area, destroy supplies, uh, get at the militia, try to bring the area back under British control. The British had made Arnold a brigadier general but he was unsuccessful in attracting enough deserters and loyalists to complete his legion. After some months in Virginia, Arnold led a raid on the area in which he was born and raised. He burned familiar New London, Connecticut to the ground. Near West Point, Allied generals Washington and Rochambeau discussed battle plans. Washington wanted to attack Clinton's army in New York, but Rochambeau had another idea. Take Cornwallis on Virginia's Yorktown Peninsula. But Washington said, but what's the point? You know, the British fleet will come down and take them away. Rochambeau said, ah, not if the French fleet comes up from the West Indies and bottles them up. For the first time in the long war, Washington saw the opportunity to use naval superiority to his advantage. They sent a message by frigate to Admiral de Grasse in the West Indies. Acting autonomously, he made one of the most momentous decisions of the war. He decided he would take a gamble and come up, uh, even though it was a hurricane season. He could spare them six weeks, that's it. Washington arranged for the transport of all troops to Virginia. He tricked Clinton into believing the Allies were heading towards his forces in New York, thus rendering him and his huge army inactive. In South Carolina, Nathaniel Green could take great satisfaction when he learned Washington was coming to Virginia for Cornwallis. We have been beating the bush, and the general has come to catch the bird. Nathaniel Green. Not far from the Yorktown Peninsula, de Grasse met a British fleet on the open ocean off Chesapeake Bay in the battle that won for the Allies their needed naval superiority. Washington marched down to uh, Virginia, and bingo, the French fleet showed up, and they had Cornwallis in this beautiful little box at the end of the peninsula. I caught sight of General Washington waving his hat at me with demonstrative gestures of the greatest joy. When I rode up to him, he explained that he had just received a dispatch informing him that de Grasse had arrived. Comte de Rochambeau. Infantryman Joseph Plum Martin, now a sergeant after five years in the Continental Army, was one of over 16,000 Allied troops to enter Williamsburg, Virginia, in anticipation of the great siege to come. We prepared to move down and pay our old acquaintance, the British at Yorktown, a visit. I doubt not, but their wish was not to have so many of us come at once, as their accommodations were rather scanty. They thought the fewer the better the cheer. We thought the more the merrier. Joseph Plum Martin. The Allies started from Williamsburg before dawn on September 28th. 
By dark, they had surrounded the British at a comfortable mile's distance. 52 gigantic French siege guns would be devastatingly effective at that range. On the 10th of October, the Allies opened fire. The enemy threw bombs. 100, 150, 200 pounders. We could find no refuge in or out of the town. The people fled to the waterside and hid in hastily contrived shelters on the banks. But many of them were killed by bursting bombs and their houses destroyed. For the enemy fired in one day 3,600 shots from their heavy guns and batteries. Stefan Pop, German mercenary at Yorktown. On the night of October 14th, the Allies assaulted two strategic British redoubts. Alexander Hamilton, who had been Washington's secretary and trusted aide, commanded one of the attacking parties. Joseph Plum Martin was with him. We were now in a place where many of our large shells had burst in the ground, making holes sufficient to bury an oxen. A man at my side received a ball in his head and fell under my feet, crying out bitterly. The fort was taken in all quiet in a very short time. Joseph Plum Martin. With the capture of the two redoubts, the Allies moved to within 300 yards of the main British encampments. Cornwallis knew the end had come. Every American and French gun was blasting away at the British fortifications, and suddenly, up on top of one of the British parapets mounted a little drummer boy, and he started beating on his drum. And then suddenly, beside the little drummer boy stood a British officer waving a white flag. And they climbed down from the parapet, and they started walking across the battlefield towards the American lines, the little guy still beating his drum. And suddenly, there was total silence on the battlefield as every cannon fell silent and everyone knew that it was the beginning of the end. I never heard a drum equal to it. The most delightful music to us all. Ebenezer Denny. Then Cornwallis had his letter of surrender delivered to Washington. I propose a cessation of hostilities for 24 hours to settle terms for the surrender of the posts of York and Gloucester. I have the honor to be, sir, your most obedient and most humble servant, Cornwallis. An ardent desire to spare the further effusion of blood will readily incline me to listen to such terms for the surrender of your posts and garrisons of York and Gloucester as are admissible. George Washington. For the first time in six long years of fighting, Washington could claim a victory against British regulars. Cornwallis did not appear at the surrender. His representative, General O'Hara, tried to present his sword to Rochambeau. The French general declined indicating that Washington was the commander-in-chief. But Washington declined the sword as well, and had his representative, Benjamin Lincoln, who had surrendered the American army at Charleston, accept the enemy's weapon. Yorktown was the, the, the greatest British disaster of the war. The surrender was uh, a most uh, humiliating, of course, a bitter experience for troops who had fought under the colors of their regiments and had to surrender them. They could hardly believe that it was happening to them. They played a tune of the day, the world turned upside down uh, as they marched out. The mortification and unfeigned sorrow of the soldiers will never fade from my memory. Some went so far as to shed tears, while one man a corporal who stood near me embraced his firelock and then threw it on the ground, exclaiming, 
May you never get so good a master again. Captain Samuel Graham, British Highlander. I noticed that the Allied officers and soldiers could scarcely talk for laughing, and they could scarcely walk for jumping and dancing and singing as they went about. An American officer, Yorktown, recounting the evening of surrender. In London, news of Cornwallis's defeat at Yorktown ushered in a new government that was interested in ending the American War and concentrating on the war against France and Spain. In America, the great British defeat came not a moment too soon for the rebels. When Washington's aide, Lieutenant Tench Tillman, rode into Philadelphia to announce the Allied victory, the Congress was so destitute that its members had to reach into their own pockets for a dollar apiece to pay for his travel expenses. Washington was wise enough to know that you can negotiate better from strength than weakness, and he feared that if he discharged his army, England would take advantage of his weakness in the peace negotiations. In the two years from the end of the Battle of Yorktown to the actual signing of the Treaty of Paris, those two years in some ways were probably the most dangerous of any of the eight years of the Revolution. Washington moved his army to Newburgh, New York, where they waited in readiness through a long winter. In 1782, as a second threadbare winter approached, he warned the Congress of his army's growing dissatisfaction. The temper of the army is much soured and has become more irritable than at any period since the commencement of the war. George Washington. By early March of 1783, Washington pondered the problem in his Newburgh quarters. Congress had not adequately addressed the army's grievances, and some of his highest officers had threatened revolt, a military coup. Every revolution except ours has turned on itself at the end and has devoured itself. Ours didn't, and it didn't because of the person of George Washington. Washington called for a meeting of the officers at nearby New Windsor in this large wooden building called the Temple. After some deliberation, he chose to address the group himself. He told them that they had fought for all of these years for freedom, but there was such animosity in the group toward the way they had been treated by Congress. He realized that he wasn't reaching them. And in one of those magic moments, he pulled a letter out to read to them uh, from a congressman to prove that Congress was indeed interested in doing what was right by the soldiers and by the officers. He couldn't read it. And there was a moment of quiet as everyone in the room looked up to see what was wrong. He reached into a, another pocket and pulled out a pair of glasses and put them on and said, Gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles. For I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. I don't believe anybody in the room heard the words of the letter, because in that moment, he, their commander for eight years, reached into the heart of every one of them. And witnesses say there was not a dry eye in the room. Washington realized that. He finished reading the letter, folded it up, put it in his pocket, and walked out. From that moment on, there was no longer any thought of uh, the army rebelling against the Congress. And probably in that moment, in that one moment, Washington had saved the American Revolution. As Washington struggled with his army's possible revolt in Newburgh, New York, an ocean away in Paris, France, American diplomats led by Benjamin Franklin and John Adams struggled to formally end the long war. The two great patriot leaders continued to maintain a mutual dislike of each other. You may depend on this. 
The moment an American minister gives a loose to his passion for women, that moment he is undone. He is instantly at the mercy of the spies of the court and the tool of the most profligate of the human race. John Adams on Franklin's French diplomacy. Mr. Adams is always an honest man, often a wise one, but sometimes absolutely out of his senses. Benjamin Franklin. Franklin seldom operated independently as a diplomat. He was usually yoked with a colleague, and the colleagues he was yoked with were almost exclusively brusque, moralistic, and demanding. Franklin was able to appear the soul of accommodation and reason in comparison. He loves his peace, hates to offend, and seldom gives any opinion until obliged to do so. It is his policy never to say yes or no decidedly. John Adams on Franklin. Portrait artist Benjamin West was never able to complete this painting of the signing of the Paris Peace Treaty because the British commissioners refused to pose for him. The agreement Franklin and his colleagues reached with Britain at the end of November 1782 had to wait nearly a year to become a formal peace. It was then that Britain finally came to terms with America's allies, France and Spain. The British came out of the war with surprisingly few losses. The great loss, of course, was the, the American colonies themselves. Now, whether that was a loss to the British or the Good Britons um, is, is arguable. I can't but feel that uh, uh, Britain was, in the long run, uh, happier without uh, colonies which no longer wanted her. In fact, soon after the war ended, the United States once more became a part of the British trade empire. So Britain enjoyed the fruits of America without having to administer colonies there. In contrast, France came out of the war bearing a huge war debt. The financial burden and the French citizenry's infatuation with the ideals of the American Revolution would lead directly to France's own revolution in 1789. In front of the Temple in New Windsor, the Continental Army heard the news that the fighting with Great Britain had come to an end. The date was April 19th, 1783, exactly eight years to the day since the first shots of the war were fired at Lexington and Concord. Over the next few months, nearly 12,000 Continental regulars set out for home, bearing little more than the muskets they had been granted as farewell gifts. Sergeant Joseph Plum Martin was among them. I confess, after all, that my anticipation of the happiness I should experience upon such a day as this was not realized. We had lived together as a family of brothers for several years, had shared with each other the hardships, dangers, and sufferings incident to a soldier's life, had sympathized with each other in trouble and sickness. Now we were to be parted forever, as unconditionally separated as though the grave lay between us. Joseph Plum Martin. On the 25th of November, the British evacuated New York City, which they had occupied since the last days of 1776. Less than two weeks later, Washington met his fellow officers for a farewell dinner at New York's Francis Tavern. After the officers had taken a glass of wine, General Washington said, I cannot come to each of you, but shall feel obliged if each of you will come and take me by the hand. General Knox, being nearest to him, turned to the commander-in-chief, who, suffused in tears, was incapable of utterance, but grasped his hand when they embraced each other in silence. In the same affectionate manner, every officer in the room marched up to, kissed, and parted with his general-in-chief. 
The simple thought that we were about to part from the man who had conducted us through a long and bloody war, and under whose conduct the glory and independence of our country had been achieved, and that we should see his face no more in this world, seemed to me utterly insupportable. Brevet Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Talmadge. Washington set out for Mount Vernon and the life of a private citizen. At Annapolis, Maryland, the governor honored him with a ball. Washington danced every dance, providing an opportunity for what the ladies present called getting a touch of him. The next day, he met Congress and with a faltering voice, resigned as Commander-in-Chief. Having now finished the work assigned me, I retire from the great theater of action and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body under whose orders I have so long acted. I here offer my commission and take my leave of all the employments of public life. George Washington. He did not take advantage of his military success and therefore set a pattern of civilian leadership, of keeping uh, armed forces in a secondary position that uh, has remained an ideal right through our history. His surrender of his sword in December of 1783 was a momentous act that electrified the world. Uh, they couldn't believe that a person who had that kind of power could give it up. Martha greeted him at Mount Vernon on December 24th. George Washington was home for Christmas. Benjamin Franklin did not rush home after the Treaty of Paris was signed in September of 1783. Instead, the old diplomat spent an additional two years in France, where he had achieved nearly godlike stature. Now in his late 70s, he became enamored with hot air ballooning. There, he received the first letter carried by hot air balloon across the English Channel. Finally, he resolved to return to America. He met his estranged loyalist son, William, at Southampton, England. But their differences still remained unreconciled. He sailed on to America. When Franklin landed in Philadelphia in late summer, 85, he was enthusiastically received by the population. All of Philadelphia was in the streets. Sally, his daughter, was waiting for him in front of her doorstep, surrounded by her children. Within a month of his return, he was elected president of Pennsylvania. Two years later, he became the host for delegates who had come to his Philadelphia to attend one of the most influential meetings in history, the Constitutional Convention. A revolution is an internal war. You've got one group that wants to destroy the constituted authority, to displace it, and to take over. So you have the war you must win, but if you just stop there, you've only gone halfway. You've torn down the old, but you haven't completed the revolution until you build up the new. Only in the United States did we have a successful revolution, the war, of the revolution and a successful building of a new nation. Being an American in 1776 is not what being an American today uh, would be. Uh, when people talked about their country, my country, they meant their state. Jefferson meant Virginia, John Adams meant Massachusetts. Uh, they talked about being Americans, but they did it the way um, an Englishman or a Frenchman today might talk about, I'm a European. Those Americans in 1777 created an agreement called the Articles of Confederation. In 1781, the separate states ratified the Articles and became the United States of America. In reality, though, the Articles only loosely bound the states together and barely increased the powers of the self-appointed Continental Congress. The Constitutional Convention would change all that by creating a strong central government that could tax, regulate trade, and deny states certain powers, such as the right to print paper money. 
If anyone in 1776, a decade earlier, had proposed such a strong, distant national government, uh, he would have been laughed off the continent. Here in Philadelphia's Independence Hall, in the same room that had seen the debate over the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the 55 delegates met through the entire summer of 1787. George Washington presided over the sessions. If to please the people, we offer what we ourselves disapprove, how can we afterwards defend our work? Let us raise a standard to which the wise and the honest can repair. George Washington at the Constitutional Convention. The guards were posted at the door. The members of the convention took an oath that they would not reveal anything to the press outside. It was a secret convention through this whole period, but members of the convention said uh, we could never have done what we did if we'd been open to the public. The document the delegates drafted was only five pages long. Its first words, we the people of the United States, reflected the victory of the Federal Union over the rights of the individual states. Virginia's James Madison and younger colleagues drove the proceedings forward, but it was the very presence of the convention's president, George Washington, that shaped much of the document's content. All they had in, as a picture were governors and king. They wanted a powerful commander-in-chief. They wanted someone who would be in charge of the army. And George Washington sitting up front as the president of the Constitutional Convention, the more they talked, the more they discussed this, they wanted this executive, and they didn't call it the president to begin with, they called it the, the executive, to look like and be like and act like George Washington. So they created it in the image of that man. When it came time for the delegates to sign the Constitution, its approval was uncertain. 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin took the floor. He made a speech which has become one of the classic rhetorical speeches in American history, arguing that they could sign it if each one of them realized that he was not infallible, that he would have to compromise, and most important, that it was the absolute best document that they could get at the time. I consent to this Constitution because I expect no better and because I am not sure that it is not the best. I cannot help expressing a wish that every member of the Convention who may still have objections to it would with me on this occasion doubt a little of his infallibility and to make manifest our unanimity put his name to this instrument. Benjamin Franklin. Washington had presided over the entire convention seated in this chair. At the convention's successful conclusion, Franklin referred to the chair's ambiguous sun image. I have often looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting. But now, at length, I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. Benjamin Franklin. The delegates took the signed constitution back to their respective states for ratification. The radical document prompted often fiery debate, but by May of 1790, two and a half years after the close of the Constitutional Convention, all 13 of the original colonies had accepted the new constitution of the United States of America. Washington's greatest contribution to the founding of the country, to the establishment of the country after the war came in turning our Constitution into reality. The day that he took the oath as president, the day that our new nation came into existence under the Constitution, the entire executive body of the government consisted of two people, the president, Washington, and the vice president, John Adams. My movements to the chair of government will be accompanied by feelings not unlike those of a culprit who is going to his place of execution, George Washington, upon being elected president. He built the entire executive system that we know today. And in his um, 
first years as president, he created the defense establishment of America that, by the way, exists intact here two centuries later. At the war's end, after seven years in the Continental Army, Joseph Plum Martin headed towards the main frontier. There he married, raised five children, and at age 70, wrote his memoirs of life in the Continental Army. He died just after his 90th birthday. Over 25,000 of the American soldiers who fought with him died in the Revolutionary War. Less than half the number of American soldiers that died in the undeclared Vietnam War. King George III ruled Britain for 60 years. He was a popular king. But late in life, a hereditary disease overwhelmed him, and George spent his last decade as a blind, deaf madman. France's revolution, inspired by the American Revolution, began in 1789. Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette were guillotined in 1793. John Adams became the second president of the United States. His wife Abigail was the first woman to be accused of manipulating the power of the presidency from behind the scenes. Thomas Jefferson defeated Adams to become the third president of the United States. On July 4, 1826, exactly 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, John Adams died. His last words were about his political rival. Thomas Jefferson still survives. Adams was wrong. Jefferson had died two hours earlier, on that same July 4th. Benjamin Franklin served as the head of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society. When he died, 20,000 attended his funeral in Philadelphia. It was the largest such ceremony America had ever seen. But his bitterness towards his loyalist son, William, extended beyond the grave through his will. The part he acted against me in the late war, which is of public notoriety, will account for my leaving him no more of an estate than he endeavored to deprive me of, Benjamin Franklin. Benedict Arnold and his wife Peggy Shippen moved to London after the war. He was never accepted in British society and died deeply in debt. In this little church in a poor section of London, he and Peggy are buried. Their bodies lie behind this wall in a community vault. George Washington became the first president of the United States of America in 1789. He served for two terms, then voluntarily gave up power, setting a precedent that lasted until the 1940s. George III couldn't fathom Washington's decision to step down as president. Washington, who died before Martha, made a provision to free his many slaves upon her death. At age 67, he lay upon his deathbed, weakened by illness and the loss of blood caused by mistaken medical procedures. Just hours before his death, he knew the end was near. Doctor, I die hard, but I'm not afraid to go. I feel myself going. I thank you for your attention. You'd better not take any more trouble about me, but let me go off quietly. George Washington. Perhaps never in history did such a small group of leaders leave a more influential legacy. The American ideals of freedom and equality became beacons of hope and reasons for revolt to the oppressed of an entire world. The United States Constitution is still the undisputed law of the most powerful nation on earth. And the question about our experiment in self-government that Benjamin Franklin posed in this room during the Constitutional Convention is as intriguing today as it was 200 years ago. He answered it for his generation. Now it's our turn to ponder it. Is it a rising sun? 
or a setting sun.